So let me very quickly uh, recap what we did uh, last time. Uh, we essentially started introducing um, this topic on how to deal with material behavior. And I told you that uh, in general, when people develop material models, these are indeed models, they can't really replicate your behavior of a material exactly. Uh, but we follow certain uh, core principles when we develop these material models. So that uh, given a strain, you can tell me or that material model can give you back what the stress is. Give me strain, I give you stress. That's, that's a material model. Um, and uh, we introduced this uh, type of material model called hyperelasticity, where I said that in any structure at, at, uh, at a particular material point in a structure, if you can write the uh, write an expression for the energy stored at a point in a structure, then uh, that energy stored would be called the strain energy density function. I again seem to be having trouble with my uh, mouse pointer here. Um, okay. <laughs> keep looping back to this. Okay, let's see. Um, so, hmm, it's ridiculous. Uh, all right, stay there. <laughs> um, so, uh, the idea was that if any structure is composed of infinitely material, uh, many material points, and at, uh, at a particular material point, you should be able to write the energy stored at that point. And if you are able to do that, you get a strain energy density function. Um, and if you integrate that over the entire volume of the body, then uh, you do get uh, the total energy stored in the body. So let me uh, go to a couple of uh, simple expressions that we had derived last time. For Hooke's model, I told you it was just half times Young's model S epsilon square. Take the derivative of that, which gives you the derivative of strain energy was stress. Derivative of stress with strain, of course, was the material model, which is equal to the second derivative with respect to the strain energy density function. And that logic carries over to 3D problems as well. Last time we were able to show that stress would be given by uh, the, uh, the gradient essentially of the strain energy density function in the strain space. So if this strain energy density function is a scalar. And you're taking the derivative of that with respect to a tensor quantity to give you back another tensor quantity. Um, and the same way, the second derivative uh, of the strain energy density function would be uh, uh, the C, I, J, K, L quantities that we were talking about last time. Go ahead, Joe. Now we're just going to the W for strain energy Right, yeah. Uh, um, so I forget what notation the book was using, but let me quickly check. Um, yes, indeed, that is W, the strain energy density function. Um, and last time we were uh, saying that in order to connect the strain and stress uh, in 3D, you have to have a fourth order tensor that typically has 81 constants and if you take make use of symmetry then you were boil, you, we were able to boil it down to 21 constants still much more than what we want um, so we'll see a couple of other uh, properties or assumptions that we can make on material behavior that would help us reduce that and last time about where we were was dealing with this uh, um, how to how to operate with this fourth order tensors so i told you that uh, if you have a fourth order tensor given as a dyadic product of four vectors, then the way it acts, a way, the way the fourth order tensor acts on a second order tensor is to take a dot product of this V with B and U with A, those were these terms, and you get the resulting second order tensor in, in terms of the, of, the, of the first couple of vectors here. Um, and if you apply that same principle, we were able to show that that's how we get the Cauchy stress SIJ terms in terms of IJ, KL, and KL. So there is a contraction over this KL. That's what uh, that's what this uh, this expression is saying. And um, I also pointed out this void notation, which is uh, sort of a views of uh, notation where we are writing the stress tensor components as a vector. 
and similarly the strain tensor components as a vector if you look at the first six that's where we said that using making use of symmetry we were able to boil it down to 21 constants and so on now um, another way to write the same expression instead of writing this big 9 cross 9 we can write the same uh, expression in terms of a 6 cross 6 matrix but in order to do that what we'll also make use of the fact is that if you look at S11 for example that would be this C11 times E11 uh, C1122 times E22 and so on so you take this entire row and multiply by this entire column and since these last three entries are the same as these three entries therefore all you need to do is to double up these coefficients right so uh, if you keep if you keep these coefficients the same that's exactly what I have here these coefficients are still the same but I'm missing three other terms so in order to account for that we would write that as two two and two there's the shear strains in this uh, uh, in this expression are uh, given by uh, this factor of 2 out here and maybe if those of you who have done three dimensional engineering strain you might recognize this 2 epsilon 1 2 as uh, sometimes people call it as uh, gamma 1 2 or gamma 2 3 or gamma 3 1 uh, that's what the engineering strain definition of the strain tensor is uh, keep in mind uh, when we defined epsilon ij we said that epsilon ij was equal to half of partial ui partial xj plus partial uj partial xi okay and if you just remove this factor of two then oh, that factor of half then you get the engineering engineering shear strains um, so this is just uh, sort of a visualization of all the material constants that we would need to relate stress to strain and indeed as I said these 21 constants are still quite a lot um, so what we'll see is what we'll try to do is to try to formulate this relationship for a class of simple materials uh, which are very often encountered um, in real life where we are talking about uh, materials that have isotropic behavior. Anybody know what that means? What is isotropic material behavior? Yeah, material behavior is same in all directions. If I have a cube of material, which is actually what I'm showing you here in the black, uh, the black and the blue deform shapes. Uh, if I have a cube of material like rubber, for example, or steel, or plain concrete, um, I, then I could be doing compression tests uh, on that cube in on any of the faces and if I were to plot the stress strain behavior I would get the exact same uh, curve well not exact same but very close to uh, very close similar curves in all three directions that's isotropic that material does not have a preferential direction of behavior I also point out here that most natural materials are actually not isotropic for example wood wood has a preferential direction of grains uh, so it is anisotropic there, there are um, uh, even you know biological materials like uh, our bones they have uh, different types of uh, sub um, sub micro constituents which have preferential directions of ligaments uh, um, or uh, striations that that form certain preferential directions but if we assume that uh, if we assume that we are dealing with a class of materials that are isotropic let's see uh, what that uh, what that uh, material relationship boils down to so what we are going again going to try to do is take a look at how the strain uh, tensors are related with the stress tensors all the possible strain tensors here you can imagine infinitely many strain ellipsoids and infinitely many stress ellipsoids how do we map between them one to one that's the material relationship in terms of the fourth order tensor that we are trying to uh, build um, so now since we are going to be talking about isotropic materials 
uh, a convenient way to define isotropic material strain energy density is in terms of its uh, invariance. And um, since we are going to define the strain energy density in terms of its invariance, uh, no matter what coordinate direction you choose, the strain itself uh, will not be able to give you any information about, about a preferential direction of the material deformation. So in that sense, a strain energy density function defined in terms of the invariance is going to be, uh, is going to be isotropic. Um, so, here I am defining it in terms of the first three, are these principal invariants or primary invariants? Anybody remember? Primary invariants. I am not talking about eigenvalues or eigenvectors here. These are not principal invariants. Even though they are related to them, these are the first three primary invariants where primary invariants of strain uh, is what I am talking about, F1, F2 and F3. And as this says trace of epsilon, trace of epsilon square, trace of epsilon cube. Uh, if you remember, those were the yeah. primary invariants. How about uh, how about the higher order invariants? Why don't I? Why did I stop at three? Say it again. Yes. So all the higher order primary invariants are indeed uh, not independent. They can be expressed in terms of the first three primary invariants, which are indeed independent. Um, so, so as soon as you make the assumption that the material behavior would be isotropic, you are down to essentially three independent variables and we will see what the consequence of that is. So if I write the strain energy density function in terms of the primary invariants, I want to be able to write an expression for stress now. Um, so stress as we know is the partial derivative with, of the strain energy density with respect to the strain. If I apply the chain rule, all I'm doing is take the partial derivative of this with F1, F1 with E, this with F2 and F2 with E and so on. Okay. So let's see what these partial derivatives of F1 with E, F2 with E, F3 with E, what are those partial derivatives? The first one I've written out here and maybe what I'll ask you to do is to take uh, a minute and tell me what expression you get out here for partial derivative of f with f1 with epsilon f2 with epsilon and then we'll do it together on the board unless that's already in the handout i hope that's not in the handout So maybe let's just do the first one. Any idea what that comes out to? What would be partial EKK with respect to partial epsilon IJ? Say it again, Vidita. Go ahead, think aloud, it's fine. You were, you were saying something about what this should be? Delta KKIJ. Delta KKIJ. You're close. I, I guess you're on the right track. You realize that uh, we are talking about things like partial of epsilon 1, 2 with respect to partial of epsilon 2, 3, something like that, right? Unless both of the indices are the same, those components are independent. So everything would be zero except only when k is the same as i and k is the same as j, which means I can write that as delta k i, delta k j, and e i dyad e j, um, which if I contract out k, this becomes i, and what is delta i j epsilon uh, e i dyad e j? Identity tensor. Indeed, so that is the identity tensor, which means that this first one is identity. Then how about the second one? So the second one would be, we'd have to use the product rule. So we would get partial k i partial lj 
uh, epsilon LK plus um, epsilon KL times partial LI partial uh, or delta K J L I and K J um, and then in the direction E I dyad E J E I dyad E J and if I contract out um, I think I have too many say it again the first the second one that's right sorry that's not I J that's L J um, so if I contract out L and K I can replace them with I and J here and same thing here I can replace them with J I and since epsilon I J is equal to epsilon J I this becomes this entire thing becomes 2 epsilon I J do you agree? Since uh, this is 2 epsilon ij ei dyad ej, what is that in terms of tensors? Simply 2 epsilon. And that means that the second term is 2 epsilon. The third one is a little more complicated, so I've uh, gone ahead and written that out. Uh, and you can see that it comes out to 3 epsilon square. Um, so the relationships are actually very similar to our regular derivatives. Uh, if I take derivative of epsilon with respect to epsilon, we get identity trace of epsilon square gives me 2 epsilon trace of epsilon cube gives me 3 epsilon square. Uh, so what we have then is that an expression that gives me stress in terms of strain. You give me strain epsilon, I can give you back stress using this equation where this first uh, all these coefficients of epsilon uh, of this identity and epsilon and epsilon square all these coefficients are just material properties now okay so um, these material properties would have to be found by doing some experiments and we'll talk about what types of experiments people do uh, but we are for isotropic materials we are down from 21 to 3 material constants okay now this does not say anything about whether this material is linear or non-linear. This in general can be a non-linear material, but it's still elastic and it's isotropic. So um, any questions on how we got to this point? Once again, all we are doing is we, are, we made the assumption that for isotropic materials, I can write the strain energy density in function uh, as a function of three invariants of strain. And as soon as I do that, I can write an expression for the stress in terms of strain. Um, and if I further restrict the behavior of isotropic materials to linear isotropic hyperelastic materials, so I've added the word linear here. If, ha if a material has to be linear, then the highest order in polynomials that the strain energy density can have is quadratic. You cannot go to the cubic term because derivative of that with respect to epsilon would not be linear, right? The, the last term out here has epsilon squared. We don't want that for linear materials. So linear materials just means we take the first two terms of that strain energy density function. And uh, in particular, one of the forms that people use is, uh, that's commonly used is, is this form where lambda and mu are called Lamé parameters of so these lambda and mu Lamé parameters. These are two material constants for linear isotropic hyperelastic materials. Um, and um, what that also means is that with two types of, with, with even the same experiment, we can uh, derive uh, we need two expressions to be able to derive these two lambda and mu uh, lambda and mu material constants. So if we plug that back in, if we take the derivatives of this phi epsilon in, as a function of this uh, expression, um, I'll plug partial of uh, 
if I take derivative of uh, of this strain energy function with respect to the first variable, which is trace of epsilon, right? This is just f one squared, right? Trace of epsilon squared. Um, that would give me two trace of epsilon. So what I would get is lambda over two times two trace of epsilon. And I know that identity uh, is the tensor for partial of F1 with partial of epsilon that stays out there plus uh, this is F2 partial of phi with respect to F2 with just so par, uh, partial of F2 with respect to F2 would just be identity uh, and we have uh, two epsilon from here. So this, this two epsilon is what we would get added here. So we would get uh, two mu epsilon and what I'll also do is remove this two from the numerator and two from the denominator. I'll just cancel that off and what I would get would be a three dimensional uh, Hooke's material model an equivalent of a three-dimensional Hooke's material model where the stress is related to strain using this expression with two material parameters lambda and mu. So this is a very important relationship that we will use again and again for different problems even in your I think in your homework you have uh, maybe one of the problems that uses this relationship where if you are given strain you have uh, and you are given two material properties lambda and mu you should be able to tell me what the stress at that point is okay Joe, you, you had a question i was going to say that if you want to find one component of that stress you just use the one the same component in the strain so it wouldn't actually work like that because you can imagine in terms of matrices this stress uh, components is a 3 cross 3 matrix on the right, you have uh, scalar, scalar identity matrix plus another couple of scalars and a strain matrix. So um, just because there is this identity matrix, uh, I mean, you have uh, that identity matrix cannot be added to uh, um, cannot be added to the strain matrix directly. Uh, there is you would, each of the components will depend on every other component. So you cannot relate that this component would be equal to that uh, some factor multiplied by that uh, the corresponding component. I'll, I'll go through a couple of examples about that and hopefully that will make it more clear. Um, but this is an important relationship that we'll use again and again for linear isotropic hyperelastic materials. And keep in mind that uh, the simple relationship that you might be used to saying that strain, a one dimensional strain if you multiply that with Young's modulus gives me stress, right? So stress is equal to Young's modulus times strain. That is a special case of this relationship as we will see in a little bit. Uh, but before I do that, let's also try to find out what are the material constants that uh, the fourth order tensor that we had talked about. So what we'll do for that is to take the derivative of the stress components with respect to the strain components and all that that means is uh, maybe I'll also write out here what Sij component would be. Sij would be lambda epsilon kk delta ij plus 2 mu epsilon ij. Right? So that's another way to see why you cannot relate just ij component here and ij component here. There is something else that contributes to that term and uh, makes it a coupled set of equations. Um, so if I take the derivative of this expression, that's written out here, um, with respect to epsilon KL, um, so all I did was KK replaced with MM, everything else is the same. Uh, what we get here um, in this part, M and K would be, have to be equal and this M would have to be equal to L. And similarly here, I would be equal to K and uh, L would be equal to J. So it would be full of uh, these deltas. So let's see what this comes out to be. 
lambda times delta m k delta m l delta i j plus 2 mu delta i k delta j l and um, this last term I'm going to write it slightly differently I'll write it as mu times delta i k delta j l plus um, delta i l delta k j okay. so what this tells me and I can also actually contract out m here so this becomes k um, so what I get here is lambda delta i j delta k l plus mu times delta i j del uh, sorry delta i k delta i k delta j l plus delta i l delta k j square brackets sort of a long relationship but everything keep in mind is only in terms of lambdas and mu's everything else is deltas which is either 0 or 1 depending upon um, depending upon the index number and if you were to write all of these 81 constants right there are 81 equations within this one initial equation if you pick values of i j k l as 1 2 3 then there are 81 constants that I'm talking about, which is the same 81 constants that we add out here. I've written one equation that describes the value of each one of these 81 constants depending upon what i, j, k, l is. Right. Go ahead. Why to split the second term into two terms? I mean, to split the two mu uh, there I, there into mu. Yeah. Right, so uh, that actually comes even before there. If you see what we did uh, out here, we made use of the fact uh, when we were talking about this, we made use of the fact that ij is equal to ji. So actually, this, this should be written as epsilon plus epsilon transpose. Now, I think it's just, I think it's more about convention here that people write this uh, in more general terms where, um, uh, yes, you're right, that indeed you can switch it back and it would be equal to two mu uh, uh, under the assumptions that we are using. It will be equal to two mu times delta i k delta j l. But as a matter of convention, we uh, write it in the form that does not make use of the fact of, of the minor symmetry of uh, epsilon i j. So we are um, even, so uh, even though I started with two mu ij, it should have really been epsilon plus epsilon transpose. So that's why I'm just writing it in that form. Um, all right. Um, so that, that one relationship gives me the value of each and every one of those 81 constants, just like I said here. Um, that relationship uh, of stress gives me, uh, uh, give me strain and I can tell you what stress is. This relationship can easily be inverted and without going through the algebra of how to do that, I'm giving you the relationship that, uh, that strain in terms of stress will be this inverse relationship. That uh, So keep in mind that uh, this relationship is useful when you know the strain tensor and you want to, want to find the strain, stress tensor. This relationship is useful when you know the stress tensor and you want to find the strain tensor. It's the exact same relationship though. Okay, And we'll see examples of both of them. All right. So let's talk about how to even determine these constants. Now, one of the simplest tests is the uniaxial tension test that I'm sure many or almost all of you have done uh, them in some lab, in a materials lab. So in this test, you have this black coupon of material stretch it, uh, put it under uniaxial tension. The stress tensor is given by sigma 1 epsilon 1 diode uh, E1 diode E1, which we know looks like sigma 1 0 0 0 0. So everything is 0, only one component is non-zero. 
How about the strain tensor? Is that also the same form? How about this? So if I do, if I stretch this, I get some strain elongation in that direction, correct? And how about the transverse direction? It shortens. So the strain is not zero. In the other two directions, the strain is not zero, uh, which we will write as epsilon 1. We will get some elongation in the primary 1, 1 direction. But in the 2, 2 and the 3, 3 out of plane direction, we would get some shortening. So I'll, I'll just write that as um, epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3. And I should actually, um, I could have written that as epsilon 2 or epsilon 3 just uh, as, uh, as those would be the eigenvalues of the strain tensor, correct? Since the strain tensor is going to be diagonal, those would be the eigenvalues of this strain tensor. Eigen directions would just be u and e to e3 under a uniaxial uh, state of stress. Um, all right. So knowing this, I can try to figure out what are the Lame parameters uh, for for this particular material. Yeah, I, if I have material one, say rubber, another material steel, I can take coupons of those two materials, go in the lab and stretch them. And now I'm going to try to figure out what are the material properties of these from, uh, from some measurements in the lab. Um, and we are going to make use of this inverse relationship. Inverse relationship, since I know the stress state, I know what the state of stress is. I want to find how much is the elongation in the one direction and how much is the shortening in the 2, 2 and 3, 3 direction. So I want to find the strains. Um, so I will use this inverse relationship which is just minus lambda over 2 mu, all of that. What is trace of sigma, uh, trace of this stress tensor? Sigma 1, that's out here. Uh, identity comes right here, 1 over 2 mu stress tensor, okay? And if I take the relationship, this relationship, and look at the 1, 1 component, this component. So uh, I'll actually write that as epsilon 1, 1. Uh, epsilon 1, 1, as I said, is equal to the first eigen, uh, uh, one of the eigenvalues of the uh, strain tensor would be equal to minus lambda over all of that factor. So this factor remains the same. And um, what we would get is 1 over 2 mu times S1, this one. So if I go through that algebra, I can just take out that first component. You would see that epsilon 1, 1 is equal to this <coughs> material constant times sigma 1. That's a very good relationship because I can measure the amount of stress I'm applying in 1, 1 direction. I can measure the amount of strain in that direction. And that immediately gives me something that we know as, as what? As the inverse of the Young's modulus, right? Sigma 1 would be equal to, if I take all of this to the other side, sigma 1 is equal to Young's modulus times uh, epsilon 1, right? So C, the Young's modulus, would be sigma 1 over epsilon 1, which would give me mu times 3 lambda plus 2 mu divided by lambda plus mu. That, um, that is a, obviously a very common uh, material constant that uses, that we use, um, and it's it, it gives it's given in terms of this um, this expression with the Lame uh, parameters. But the important thing is just measure epsilon one, uh, measure sigma one and epsilon one. You know what the uh, what the Young's modulus is. Okay, with the same experiment, I can also figure out. Um, Another important material property, which is called Poisson's ratio, which hopefully you remember is negative of epsilon 2, 2 divided by epsilon 1, 1 or epsilon 3, 3 divided by epsilon 1, 1. What is Poisson's ratio? It, it measures the ratio of uh, shortening in the lateral direction to extension in the longitudinal direction, right? So that expression can also be obtained exactly from this, this relationship we had here. We wrote this relationship for 1, 1 component. We got that. If you do the same thing for 2, 2 or 3, 3 component, you would get this relationship. And um, if you invert this, you can see that Poisson's ratio 
would be equal to if I take this minus and epsilon 1 1 to the other side I am left with lambda over 2 plus uh, lambda lambda plus mu which would be so lambda over 2 times lambda plus mu that's Poisson's ratio which can be easily measured in an experiment right I can measure what is the elongation in one one direction I can measure what is the shortening in the other two directions that gives me Poisson's ratio I can measure stress and strain in the longitudinal, longitudinal direction that gives me the Young's modulus two constants as soon as I have stress uh, as soon as I have C and mu I can try to invert those relationships and I can get uh, Lame parameters lambda and mu. So again, um, for linear isotropic hyperelastic materials, we need only two material constants, lambda and mu, or C and nu, just two material constants uh, to be able to describe material behavior. Where you give me strain, I can give you stress, or you give me stress, I can give you strain. And these material properties can be easily measured with this uniaxial tension <coughs> experiment. Make sense? Okay. Questions? <laughs> um, all right. So I think, yeah, you need some time to digest all of this relationship. Uh, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, so you said before that you can't find one component out of that equation, but then. That's right. So my point was that you cannot just say that this one one component is related to this uh, corresponding one one component in general. For this particular stress state and this particular strain state, yes, there is a one to one relationship which does not involve other components. But that's not true in general. Okay. Um, all right, so let me talk a little bit about another experiment that's uh, very commonly done for predominantly uh, geotechnical materials. How many of you have done this triaxial test in a lab? <laughs> what fun, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but uh, so the idea here is that you have a material sample, black, uh, again shown in the black, and then after deformation, you get this blue shape but you impose this this is a very sort of a challenging test and you have to be very careful with this but uh, it's a very useful test uh, for material properties of things like soil which is you can't really do a tension test on soil right so uh, so the idea there is that you take this uh, uh, sample of material and you uh, subject it to lateral pressure only okay now the way that you uh, impose the lateral pressure is by of course putting it in a chamber filling it with water tightening up all the uh, 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 all the drainage and there's again different types of uh, tests drained and undrained tests there but um, but essentially the idea is that you impose a lateral pressure of sigma 2 on the uh, on the curved surface of the cylinder and you apply a different sigma 1 by compressing it from top and bottom so that's essentially a triaxial uh, test where you are imposing the state of strain uh, the state of stress which can be given by uh, by this expression sigma 1 epsilon 1 dyad uh, e1 dyad e1 plus sigma 2 E2 dyad E2 plus E3 dyad E3. <coughs> and if I were to write that in terms of components, it would be sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 2. Um, you're right. So typically they are negative. Uh, the value that I would put here for sigma 1 and sigma 2, yes, the value that I would put there would be negative. But I'm just writing that as a variable. So, um, can you tell me what the state of strain would be for this material? You can uh, going from this black configuration to this blue configuration. Um, what uh, can I write a similar expression for strain? Right, there is definitely shortening in the one one direction. 
there is shortening in the 2, 2 and 3, 3 directions as well. So, um, the shortening in the 2, 2 and 3, 3 directions should be the same, but in the 1, 1 direction should be the, should be different. So, we will get very similar um, expression for epsilon as well, e1 dyad e1 plus epsilon 2 e2 dyad e2 plus e3 dyad e3 and again this is also uh, referred to as epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3 on the diagonals. There is no off diagonal components in this e1, e2, e3 basis. Um, all right, so now we are going to try to relate these uh, applied applied pressure sigma two and applied uh, stress sigma one to the measured strains epsilon one and epsilon two. Right? We can measure the strains and we can we we know what uh, traction what uh, stresses we have applied. Um, so to do that, we are going to define a bunch of quantities now. So we'll just go through uh, these definitions. I am going to take this, the trace of the stress tensor, that is the sum of these guys, sigma 1 plus 2 sigma 2 and I am going to define something called sigma which is called the equivalent pressure in the sample and actually since uh, I am uh, I am defining it as a variable, a positive variable would be equivalent positive suction not pressure. So this sigma is uh, the value should come out to be negative for it, in order for it to be a pressure. So, 3 sigma is just the trace of the stress tensor, trace of the strain tensor is epsilon plus 2 epsilon 2 is equal to eps, uh, this E. This E is dilation and um, this, is, uh, uh, this is a relationship that you may not have seen before uh, in the kinematics. You remember when we were talking about kinematics, we said change in volume is given by the determinant of F, right? If I take original volume V, multiply the determinant of F and integrate it over the body, I get the deformed volume V, right. So uh, that uh, was the ratio of the change in volume and determinant of F is equal to the root square root of determinant of C, C is just F transpose F, right. C itself in, can be written as I plus 2 Lagrangian strain, right. The Lagrangian strain is half of C minus I and if I now use a uh, binomial theorem to try to expand it, you can go through it that algebra, I think maybe it is given in the book or you, you can try it yourself. You can show that this can be uh, approximated as 1 plus trace of this guy, trace of this uh, Lagrangian strain tensor. For small deformation, that is nothing but 1 plus trace of epsilon because for small deformation we neglect the quadratic term in it in this e and we get down to that and therefore if I take one to the other side I get dilation which is change of volume divided by original volume that is v minus v over v that is equal to trace of or approximately equal to trace of epsilon. So a crude measure of the change in volume over original volume which is what we call dilation is nothing but the trace of the strain, linearized strain tensor. We went through all that algebra to try to figure out uh, how the volume of a body changes, right, Det determinant of f and triple integral and all that. But a crude measure of the change of volume, if you need that, is just take the trace of the strain tensor at a point, integrate that over the volume of the body, that would give you the total change in volume of the body. Um, all right, so we have defined effective pressure, uh, equivalent pressure and dilation. We are going to try to relate those two um, using some material constant. So to do that, we will go back to the Hooke's material model, which was stress is equal to, um, so if I can pull that back somewhere, I am going to make use of this relationship that we had originally written except I am going to take trace on both sides, okay, right, trace of S on the left hand side, what is trace of identity, trace of identity is 3, right, so 3 lambda times trace of epsilon plus 2 mu times trace of epsilon, right, that is how we get 3 lambda plus 2 mu in that expression that I am showing you here, 
uh, 3 lambda plus 2 mu trace of epsilon if, if I just take trace on both sides. Now this we have defined as 3 sigma up there, this we have already defined as dilation, this is what we are going to call 3 times bulk modulus. Bulk modulus I am sure you have uh, used before or at least heard of before which relates the change in volume of a body with, uh, with respect to the hydrostatic pressure or the equivalent pressure that the body is under. And now if I just divide, uh, if I divide off 3 on both sides, I can write, um, I can write an expression for k, k would be uh, this sigma divided by e. So uh, that gives me lambda uh, plus 2 over 3 mu. And that's an expression for the bulk modulus and what we get here is uh, the effective pressure in a body or the equivalent stress in a body can be given using the bulk modulus times the dilation at a point. And um, I think I should have mentioned this point before as well. In both of these experiments, in the uniaxial test and in this triaxial test, we are making one critical assumption. We are saying that everywhere in that sample, our state of stress and state of strain is the same, is uniform, right? So, and overall that is not exactly true. So we are homogenizing the state of the sample as a single constant uh, stress field and a strain field. But uh, overall, these experiments are able to uh, are able to do that. Um, there is a bunch of algebra that uh, we go through and I think maybe I'll have to leave that to, uh, to the next lecture. But uh, as a final point, I'll also uh, point you to this relationship. This is actually one of the problems in, the, in your textbook. Um, as I've been saying again and again, for linear elastic isotropic uh, materials, you need only two material constants to define uh, the material behavior. We have been talking about lambda and mu. Equivalently, you could be talking about C, the Young's modulus, and nu, the Poisson's ratio. We have just defined the bulk modulus. You pick two of those. You can uh, you can write expressions for any other combination. So lambda and mu can be expressed in terms of C and nu. C and nu can be in term uh, can be expressed in terms of lambda and mu and so on. Okay. So uh, so I'll stop here and then we'll try to finish this out finish this chapter out on Monday and I'll see you back um, in the room 3153 for the review session today and if, of course if you have any questions on the homework you can bring them there all right I'll see you at 3.30.